Hello, and welcome to The Dig, where we cover 12 archeological sites in 12 months. Each month we feature a different archeology span site, and then you can go to Instagram at AITC underscore DC, and for the 30 days of that month, learn all about the artifacts that are associated with that site. Now come with us as we dig into archeology. span My name is Bob Painter. I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I am Whitney Battle Baptiste. I am an assistant professor here at UMass Amherst Department of Anthropology. And we're co-directors of the archaeology at the W.E.B. Du Bois home site in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. W.E.B. Du Bois was one of the most important Americans of the 19th and 20th century. He was an international figure in the 95 years of his life. He was the first African American to receive a PhD from Harvard. He is most famous as the author of The Souls of Black Folk, which is a collection of essays that give one an understanding of African American life in the late 19th, early 20th century that rings true straight to today. He was a co-founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. He was on one of the committees that co-founded the United Nations. His entire life, which spanned from just after the Emancipation Proclamation, and he died on the eve of the March on Washington, which is a long time. He was interested in exploring the kinds of alternatives to the Jim Crow world and the persisting firm and brutal color line that ran through the United States and led him to be sympathetic in the Cold War to countries that were seen as enemies of the United States. Du Bois joined the Communist Party USA, and I underline that because it wasn't the Communist Party Russia or the Communist Party Soviet Union. Um, it was the Communist Party USA. This fact alone looms so large in the minds of so many people that it led them to disparage and forget the contributions that Du Bois had made for 80, 90 years to understanding the American way of life, to understanding the role of Africa in the world. The legacy of Du Bois should be deeply entrenched in the story of Great Barrington because he was born there. Great Barrington has undergone significant changes, even in the time period since Du Bois was born. As it grew from being a commercial hub and a center place for agricultural farmers to increasingly adding industrialization, and factories to having the farming economy become secondary in its importance. The question of how is this reflected in the archaeology itself and in the material culture is exactly one of the questions that we would like to better understand. So the Burghardt family, Du Bois's family, has been living in, working over, walking through, coming to grips with this stretch of Great Barrington since the very beginning of European settlement. The Burkhards are present in Great Barrington in the 1800s, and that house is built sometime early on. So we were trying to find a timeline about how the actual structure developed over time. We still don't know the answer to that, but we do know that from there, Othello and Sally Burkhard, W.E.B. Du Bois's grandparents, were there during the 18. 60s. And that's where Du Bois lives from the age of one to about four. And then Lena and Edward Wooster move in there in the late 1800s. Edward Wooster was W.E.B. Du Bois' cousin through the Burkhard line. His last name was Wooster because that was his father's name. But Lena and Edward Wooster lived there from the late 1890s until 1919 when they moved to Springfield. In 1928, Du Bois turned 60. On his 60th birthday, a group of his friends and supporters gave him, 
gifted him the title of the deed of, to the House of the Black Burgards for his 60th birthday. You know, the timing couldn't have been worse to get the house in 28 and then have the stock market collapse out from under you in 29. It'd be like getting some kind of property in 2008. He had to choose between whether or not he was going to put his resources, meager as they were in the 1930s, he was going to distribute those between his, his family and his um, physical well-being and the major social enterprise that he was engaged in, which was keeping the NAACP and especially the crisis financially fit and, and stable. Painstakingly, all the money that he put into it was to redo the roof, secure the foundation, rebuild the chimney. He wanted it to be a retreat. He wanted to retire there. He wanted it to be a space of reflection, a space where he could play music and listen to music. He wanted it to be a place where he could sit in front of the fire like his grandfather, Othello Burkhardt, did. That never happened. 1951, he gets put on trial. It's a sedition trial in which his involvement with a peace organization that was basically anti-nuclear weapons put him on the radar of being an enemy of the state. By 1954, he was weary. I think his dream of using the House of the Black Burkhards to be his retreat in a country that had just put him on trial at the age of 80, he couldn't bring it together. And so in 1954, he sold it after all of his efforts to try to keep it standing, to try to bring it up to a place where he could actually remodel it. It was torn down and pushed toward the back of the property. And that pushing it toward the back of the property in some ways was beneficial to archeologists because it kind of sealed all of these artifacts that were inside the structure itself. Archaeology is an interesting practice. It seems to most people like what it's about is squares and trowels manipulating the ground, and it is about that. But of course what we're trying to do is we're not trying to just collect artifacts. What we're trying to do is understand the way people lived their lives in the past. And people didn't live their life just there within the confines of the site. The challenge for archeologists is to take these static objects that we find, the building remains that are there, and put them into motion. 30,000 plus artifacts, what they symbolize is a story of a family and not Du Bois. I cannot, with good conscience, say that any of the artifacts that we have in this lab, I can directly link to W.E.B. Du Bois. He lived there as a child. However, that property, that house, as he refers to it as the house of the Black Burgards, was a part of his DNA. It was a part of his, his soul. It was a part of his identity. However, the artifacts point in a different direction. I hear the story of Lena and Edward Wooster who lived there till 1919 and had six children. We find shoes, we're finding lotion bottles, we're finding Noxzema beauty products, we're finding decorative tea sets. I mean, things that point to the daily lives of the Wooster family, which were cousins of Du Bois through his Burkhardt, through his maternal line. But what that talks about is the kinds of consumer choices that African Americans were making, the kinds of accessibility or their ability to buy mass-produced goods. How did they get those mass-produced goods? I really focus on choice and not circumstances. What were the tastes of Lena Wooster? Those kinds of questions are what those 30,000 artifacts mean to me. I think that it's about the domestic spaces, the material that we pull out of the ground, that we attempt to interpret, is enhanced when we use it as a means to find out what the different opinions of what this stuff means. One of the most interesting things that comes from doing the history of the 
Burghardt family of Du Bois's relatives in Great Barrington is to realize that African descent people have been crucial to the construction of New England since the arrival of European settlement. People of African descent in New England were not only just here, but they experienced segregation, they experienced isolation, they experienced um, control over their actions, where they could live, where they couldn't live. And Native Americans as, suffer from these kinds of constraints as well. And that kind of heritage is also obscured from like a central focus. So it's a mythical place, New England is. And sites like the W.B. Du Bois home site begin to kind of illuminate the complexity of race, the complexity of race and class together, the complexity of the fact that New England was not exclusively white. It was a place where Europeans came, Africans came, and Native people were here. The history of New England being based in part on enslaved labor, reflection about um, the continued presence and contributions made by African descent people to American history in Western Massachusetts. All of these are made easier and realer, I think, when you can visit places and imagine people work, walking and working those landscapes. We're just building on Du Bois's efforts to commemorate his family and to commemorate the African-American history of, of Great Barrington. <laughs>